Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm very honored and privileged to be here, so thank you so much for extending the invitation. So before I begin my talk to you today on gender and social justice in forestry and agriculture, I wanted to take just a minute to consider why we are here at the conference today. So just 10 seconds. So since I'm here, let me start with myself. <laughs> I'm a researcher who are, who's interested in using my research and experiences to contribute to socially inclusive change. So I would say that I'm interested in academic standards of rigor and balance, and yet have a strong normative commitment underlying the work that I do. And I'm here today because I see this as an opportunity for fruitful pause and reconsideration. I would like to engage and learn from the many wonderful scholars who are at this conference and improve what I strive to do through this learning and feedback. You may have other reasons, but let's keep these in mind as we move forward with this talk. So today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the defining challenges that lie ahead of us in this continuum, let me call it continuum, between agriculture and forestry from a gender and social justice perspective. I would I, would, I will also like to share my thoughts and experiences on to what extent and how can policies and interventions in these sectors contribute to addressing them, and what can we do as researchers to ensure that we are headed in the path towards sustainable development, one that is environmentally sound and also socially just and inclusive. So during my presentation, I will draw a lot on a wide range of research that has been carried out in the field of gender and development more broadly, in the forestry sector and those by C4 in, um, C4 in particular. So as many of our speakers, many of the former speakers have said, we are witnessing a world that is undergoing unprecedented changes. Some of it is due to changes that are outside of our hand. Some of it is changes that we have generated ourselves and so others are due to how we've responded to these changes. So at C4, we're focusing on a number of such changes and what these mean for people and for us. These include expansion of markets, changing climate, demographic changes, particularly the growing migration mo mobility and increasingly multi-sidedness of rural households. And, ra and a wide range of policies and interventions in the name of food, fuel, fiber, conservation, and climate change. So from a gender justice perspective, these changes are opening up spaces for women and girls, especially in traditional male-dominated sectors. For instance, my colleague Marcus, who's here today, it, today's, his ongoing work is in the charcoal value chains in Zambia, and he's finding that women are challenging pre-existing gender restrictions dictating where they can go, what they can sell, and what can they do with their earnings. These women are participating in even more lucrative areas that were pre previously reserved for men, earning more than they did previously too. Their contributions are being recognized at the household level, and this in turn is influencing their position and bargaining at the home. So combination of factors is playing a role in these changes for women. For example, relaxing of traditionally fixed gender relations at the household and community levels, policy interventions aimed at promoting women, and favorable market conditions for women's enterprise. But we're also finding that many of these interventions are designed and in implemented at levels that are beyond women's reach women often have limited voice and influence on negotiations over conversion of land. The risks posed by a changing climate are unknown and still unfolding. And it is questionable whether and how women's collective and individual capabilities can respond to these risks and adapt to these changes. As a consequence, existing gender inequalities are exacerbated, women's voices are getting further restricted, women's burden in caring for others is increasing, and their capabilities are diminishing. Well, my slide is not as informative as the other speakers. <laughs> so I have more pictures and a film to show at the end. 
So how do we begin to understand these changes, let alone to addressing them? Let's go back and look at how gender and social justice is being framed in the forestry sector. The forestry sector has a long but troubled history of engaging with gender issues. For instance, in my country, Nepal, women's inclusion in forestry programs dates back to the first master plan in forestry sector in the late 1980s. But for gender issues to be considered seriously in forestry policy, practice, and research, it had to be framed in terms of how gender equality and women's empowerment would contribute to sustainable forest management, reduce deforestation, poverty reduction, and lots of other environmental and developmental goals. As a researcher, practitioner, and someone actively following progress on women's rights both globally and in my home country, I found these concerns relevant but problematic for four reasons. First, why cannot gender equality and women's rights be goals in and of themselves? Why must they be viewed principally as instruments for achieving other goals? After all, glaring and persistent gender equalities in representation, resources, division of work, are pressing challenges across developing and developed countries. The forestry sector has much to contribute to addressing them. For instance, research in India has shown that reducing deforestation can augment access to forest foods and income that are particularly important for poor women. Second, I saw that women, just as men, are differentiated along class, caste, and other social differences. And women, just as men, are not conservation friendly if there are no adequate incentives in place, if their entitlements over resources such as land are insecure, and if res the responsibility of caring for children and elderly falls disproportionately on their shoulders. So just adding women is insufficient to guarantee better forest outcomes. Third, when women are just added into existing forestry and conservation programs, without thinking through how these policies and programs can also be beneficial to them, then women's presence is just tokenistic. And even worse, existing gender inequalities are heightened because women now need to add participation in forestry projects and programs alongside everything else that they have to do every day. Finally, narrowly and exclusively focusing on the agency of women leaves men and boys out of this picture. It also shifts responsibilities for addressing structural inequalities along gender lines on the shoulders of women, rather than also on the state, private sector, NGOs, and other actors who you can say are the right duty bearers. Hence, such an instrumental view of gender in forestry oversimplifies complexity, shifts responsibility, and as Sylvia Chant argues, risks ag aggravating many of the complex problems the gender and justice movement seek to address. So in comparison to this, the global framework on development since 2000 has sought to challenge and reverse such instrumental views on gender equality. The Millennium Development Goals was the first to recognize gender equality and women's rights as a goal in itself, rather than valued as an instrument for achieving other goals. But as Naila Kabir points out, its translation of the goal was disappointingly narrow. It only included closing gender gap in education, wage employment in non-agricultural sector, and proportion of seats held by women in national parliaments. The SDG builds on the MDG, but has a much broader focus. SDG 5 on gender inequality includes many issues that women's movements have been arguing for many generations as holding women, women's enjoyment of rights back, such as rights to land and productive resources, recognition and redistribution of care, voice, representation, and leadership in decision-making at all levels. The SDG 5 is also not devoid of criticisms. Some argue that SDG, including SDG 5, is a laundry list, while others say it does not go far enough. Still others argue there's a gulf between aspirations behind SDG 5 and the targets and indicators for measuring progress. Others, such as Sahara Razavi, ma maintain that SDG is right in not allowing data and availability to define our goals. We should measure what we treasure rather than treasure what we measure, she puts it. 
But she reminds us that SDG 5 will only be realized if the do dominant economic model is changed and stronger accountability measures are put in place. Notwithstanding these criticisms and the imperfections surrounding the global development framework, the MDG and SDG have brought gender inequality and full enjoyment of rights by women as women and girls as a moral imperative. The SDG 5 views gender inequality as a relational issue and as a matter of structural inequality which needs addressing directly not only by women but by development organizations, private sector, governments and wider society. In this respect, it serves as a conceptual framework to understand what is meant by gender equality as well as a strong normative foundation behind what is involved in addressing it. So this is where we work at C4, some of the countries where we're working. So at C4, we've adopted a two-pronged approach to aligning our work with the SDG framework. First, we're using the global development framework to better understand gender issues across a wide range of topics. And here, we've been able to better understand that there are areas of strength, room for further improvement, complete gender blindness, and areas where there is considerable resistance to engaging with gender considerations altogether. The forestry sector, thanks to the pioneering work of scholars such as Bina Agrawal, Madhu Sarin in India, have contributed quite a bit to understanding why women don't participate in seemingly inclusive institutions set up to govern forests at the local level. The research begins with the standpoint that policy efforts aimed at reducing deforestation, enhancing livelihoods, which are all desirable objectives, must consult both women and men users about their priorities and constraints, rather than assume that their interests are aligned with preconceived policy aims and visions. This research has found that such widespread exclusion of women stems from interlocking relations of inequality at household, community, and state levels. Enhancing women's participation matters for both women's well-being and improved forest management um, outcomes. But for this to happen, women representatives need to be allowed to forge clear links and relations of accountability with women constituents. There must be a critical mass of women to make a difference amongst other preconditions. This literature has inspired a new generation of forest policy formulation and implementation in South Asia. For instance, going back to Nepal again, from only prioritizing women as long as they contribute to forest management goals, contemporary forest policies guidelines for implementators cause both women and men to be registered and hence legally identified as community forestry users. They also dictate that 50% of community forestry decision-making body must be women. The new forest strategy goes a step further and talks about ensuring that there are clear links between participation and gender equitable benefit sharing. There is considerable gulf between policy and practice. As Andrea Nightingale, a scholar who is based at SLU, puts it, women are often just sitting in rather than actively participating in decision-making processes. But, with, but most women rights advocates would argue that all of this is a step in the right direction. And as many of the newly elected women representatives of local governments across the country are from the network of community forestry user groups, the investment made in enhancing women's participation in forestry most likely has had spillover, positive spillover effects on wider governance in the country. And as some experts argue, it could very well be one of the lasting legacies of the forestry sector for moving the country towards a path for sustainable and gender just development. Across the world, there is a growing social movement fueled by donors and NGOs to recognize indigenous and collective forests and lands in the context where such resources were either handed over to private sector, monopolized by the state, or both. At the same time, feminist movement have made considerable headway in changing gender unequal laws, restricting women from owning private property. 
In Nepal, for instance, from a situation where only women who are 35 years or older and unmarried are legally allowed to make claims on parental land, both men and women now have equal rights to parental property. However, many indigenous people's movements are reluctant to recognize intra-community diversity and women's rights within collectively held land, while women's movement only considers privately owned land. Many of my colleagues who work on the intersection between gender and tenure reform in Latin America, Africa, and Asia fear that while these reforms are long overdue, they remain inadequate. In other cases, the very framing of sustainability is so narrow that there is little room to give equal weight to sustainability in its fullest sense. Zero deforestation pledges are a particularly lucid illustration of this. Much of the current discussion on corporate commitments to eliminate deforestation from supply chains by 2020 or the zero deforestation pledges focus on whether corporations will adhere by these pledges and or the extent to which smallholders would also be able to continue participating in global value chains given the difficulties in complying with high standards. Concerns over rights and equality are on the sidelines of these discussions. Despite mounting evidence that corporate practices have acutely gender differentiated and socially unequal impacts. This includes research carried out by C4 in the palm oil sector in Indonesia, which I will get into in a minute. So going back to our efforts to align our work with the SDG framework, with regards to our second approach, as applied research institutes, primarily accessing development funds, we are concerned with maintaining both the quality and rigor of our work, as well as engaging with a wide range of st stakeholders at multiple levels to ensure that our research matters. The policy space, as we know, is very complex and difficult to navigate, and the balancing of research and development tasks, outcomes, an even more daunting task. So we work with existing spaces and actors, supporting those who need a nudge to those who require significant and tailored investments on our part. As such, our research ranges from action research, um, which, uh, for instance, helping women leaders and representatives who have limited access to forest lands at the very local level to negotiate change and monitoring the effects on women's well-being and forest cover, supporting women's movement with information and evidence that they would need to make their advocacy stronger, helping government ministries with tailored advice and support, we are increasingly uh, working alongside women's ministries, which often, which often oversee the overwhelming task of mainstreaming gender across government operations, but are most often understaffed and under-resourced. And using evidence and knowledge to bring different groups of people together to deliberate on uncomfortable questions and come to a con consensus around the paths ahead um, we facilitate such dialogues at multiple levels, from global, such as during the UNFCC COP. Um, if you're planning to go, please um, keep a uh, look out our, in our website. And the Global Landscapes Forum to regional, national, and local levels. We recognize that all of these are inadequate. Our role is either not needed or unwelcomed. When we contribute to meaningful changes, the larger impact is minuscule, and we risk adding to uneven geographies. But when we support larger reforms, the consequences are not always foreseeable, and the gulf between formulation and implementation is always a persistent challenge. It is even more difficult to try and disentangle what we are able to do, given our own limitations, with the results that our donors expect from us. Nevertheless, we continue striving to align our work with the Global Framework on Sustainable Development so that we contribute knowledge and evidence to advance a global vision rather than strive for results in a peaceful and isolated manner. On that note, please allow me to end this presentation with a short documentary that we made based on our research on gender and oil palm in Indonesia. This is part of a three-part short documentaries we made, and we showed them during a policy dialogue that we held earlier this year in Jakarta 
to spark a conversation among corporate representatives, women's rights groups, certification bodies, and government rec representatives about gender issues in palm oil sector. It is an illustration of our attempts to experiment with a wide range of methods to foster dialogue and consensus around broadening the debate on corporate commitments to sustainability. Thank you. Sebelum ada perkebunan kelapa sawit, hutan semua di sini. Dulu kan masih enak orang itu cari sayur, cari ikan, beladang, kah. itu apa, cari berburu, cari binatang kan. Dulu kan masih banyak, sekarang ini tidak ada lagi. Ikannya masih ada, cuma itu binatang-binatang lain agak susah dapat sekarang ini. Nama saya, nama lengkap saya Madelena Pandan. Umur saya 35 tahun. Pekerjaan saya sehari-hari perkebunan kelapa sawit, yaitu pertanian. Ini mau sekolah nanti. Kayaknya harus dimasukkan dulu. Saya bangun pagi jam 3 subuh, yaitu saya berangkat nore, yaitu langsung masak. Udah masak, saya nyiapkan barang-barang saya, makanan saya, minuman saya. Waktu itu saya mandi. Udah mandi, saya beres-beres tuh anak saya yang baru usia 5 tahun 9 bulan tuh. Dia udah mau berangkat ke sekolah. Selesai gini, baru santai-santai kita nunggu itu. Jemputan datang. Emang sih rasanya agak capek, tapi apa boleh buat lah saya kan udah punya anak sekolah. Yang satunya kelas 2 SMA, yang satunya baru kelas 1 SMP. Apa boleh buat lah, karena bapaknya kan mengharapkan cuma bapaknya cari uang, pekerjaan di sini tidak mampu dia sendiri carinya. Makanya bantu dia tuh cari uang untuk membiaya anak sekolah. Tuh. Biarpun capek. Saya tetap bangun setiap hari itu jam 3 subuh Untuk saya cari uang untuk nyekolahkan anak, untuk makan minum, untuk apa-apa aja ya nah. Setelah saya udah ngantar anak saya sekolah, jam setengah enam itu Saya berangkat ikut terak ke tempat PT saya tuh Pupuknya mulai dari jam 8 Udah itu Istirahat jam 10 Jam 10 kurang Istirahat minum Udah itu Istirahat makan jam 11 Jam 11 Udah itu berangkat lagi mupuk Selesai tidak selesai jam Sekitar jam 12 lah Gaji saya cuma 86 ribu Tidak mencukupi sebenarnya Apalagi kan untuk biaya anak saya ke sekolah tuh tidak mencukupi sebenarnya. Kan BHL kan tidak bisa lebih dari 20 hari eh 20 hari itu. Tanggungan apa-apa kan tidak ada kalau BHL tuh. Perempuannya ada juga laki-laki gabung bisa juga laki-laki. Tapi kalau perempuannya cukup laki-laki tidak -laki diambil cuma untuk lansir ya masuk ke dalam itu. Target saya itu satu satu hari itu 300 kilo, satu satu pokok itu 2 kilo. Setelah selesai mupuk, tangan saya rasanya perih, apalagi luka-luka kayak gini. Rasanya perih sekali. Kalau udah lama-lama anda itu dari cuci, ndak terasa lagi perihnya. 
udah kayak biasa lagi takut sih sebenarnya tapi ndak ndak itu apa ndak bisa ngambil pupuk cepat-cepat ke tempat itu makanya ndak pakai sarung tangan sebenarnya saya ndak mampu lagi ke depannya sebenarnya rasanya ndak mau lagi tapi apa boleh buat kalau ndak ada kerja lain kan kita pergi ke kebun kelapa sawit lagi sampai ke rumah itu kalau ada kesempatan ladang yang nanam padi ini saya umur padi saya baru tiga bulan sampai ke tempat panen nanti sampai enam bulan hasilnya enak yang di tani ini enaknya apa kalau kita kan di tani ini kalau dapat padi banyak kan kita tidak beli beras lagi saya ingin saya sekolahkan anak saya ke depannya supaya anak saya jadi anak eh, jadi orang bagus saya tidak ingin anak-anak saya kerja seperti saya nih supaya ke depan dia bisa bagus Thank you, Bimbika. Please, uh, please come back up here. I think this film really shows clearly under what extreme tough conditions many women in rural areas are living and working. Uh, and did you say that you use this, these films in, in, in the projects that you are working with? And how, what, can you tell us a bit more on that? How can you use them and what kind of reactions do you meet? So uh, we had a we organized a policy dialogue earlier uh, this year in Jakarta, and we, as I mentioned in my presentation, we brought different representatives uh, from women's movement, women's indigenous movement, to certification bodies, to um, corporate representatives. Actually, the corporate representative we brought was um, uh, from this plantation, actually. Um, and uh, the topics w and uh, the IFC as well, because they're working quite a lot on gender responsive smallholder inclusion. So um, the topics were threefold, where we discuss uh, free prior informed consent um, and uh, decent employment for women and gender inclusive smallholder um, inclusion, um, especially in light of these pledges and what they mean for conforming to these high standards. Um, uh, and it was quite interesting because we had a uh, discussion with everybody before we had the dialogue. So we kind of had a feeling that what, uh, what each person was going to say, but we hadn't showed these videos. And actually this is a part of a four documentary series. Please feel free to see them there online on YouTube. So the first one was on free prior informed consent. The way it's currently um, understood at the moment only focuses on companies and communities, but does not look at um, issues within communities. So the, the, the women's rights groups in particular were talking about how women's groups are, you know, like women in particular, or certain women, indigenous women in particular, have different uh, understanding, different uh, interests, different expectations from, from um, whether or not plantations can go ahead or not, but then these voices are really not heard um, because it's a male representative who does the... Um, and for decent employment, uh, we used this video. And it was interesting because we knew the corporate representative was going to say that yes, it's true, casual employment is, in, is, is, a, is a widespread phenomenon in plantations, but it's a matter of choice for women a mm. choice to, uh, you know, to engage in palm oil sector while also doing soil and agriculture, taking care of their homes. Whereas this video illustrates that it's not really a choice. 
So it was quite interesting to have that discussion and our, our panelists had obviously different views. And, and I think these videos really helped to sort of, you know, illustrate and give greater spark to the discussions that preceded. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have